Today is the 29th of July, 2014. The topic is the Supreme Court and the police state. And my guest is David DeWitt, reporter for the Athens News. I am Robert Whaley, retired historian at Ohio University. And this is the Athens Speak Out, number 317. Now I'm going to make a long statement uh, about spies in the beginning with the Franklin Rose administration in uh, 1932 to 45. And then I will say something about Truman and his administration, 1945 to 1952, and the next administration, Eisenhower, 1952 to 1960. Then I'm going to give a quick speed up and get down to the resignation of Richard Nixon in August of 1974. Now, the fundamental uh, truth is that spies are recruited during wartime because of fear of threats from abroad and another war. And Roosevelt was concerned about the Nazis and the Germans, and most Americans were concerned about communist Russia and communist China and Vietnam. In light of this, the uh, proposition you might make of this is that I'm going to speak a little bit too long. And if you think I am talking too long, you can cut me off at any time. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> because I tend to be a historian and say too much. And you being the journalist, want to get up to the present moment. Uh, my theme is that the fear of communism and anti-communism that began in 1945 at the end of the Second World War was exaggerated. And the fear of spies are self-destructive to American democracy. And uh, one month ago, we discussed this same topic with a slightly different title. How can the people believe in democracy and check the growing threat of a police state? And I am uh, one of the few who go back to World War I and World War II and observe the Korean War in 1950-53 and American intervention in the long Indo-Chinese civil wars from 1961 to 73, and then uh, President Clinton intervened in the quickly forgotten Yugoslav Civil War, and we now have the unresolved wars in Israel, Iraq, Syria, and President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry don't seem to know what they want to do next about the Gazan crisis and the Ukrainian crisis. And uh, I think that the Congress has been in a state of paralysis since the 1980s. And uh, the democracy then is uh, in paralysis in Congress because of incompetent hacks in both parties. The Democratic Party are ruled by hacks in the Congress, and the Republican Party are ruled by a different set of hacks, and they keep passing the book to one another since the 1980s and have no solutions to the war or to the advancing uh, police state. So uh, the fear then uh, comes from the fact that uh, 
at the high school level, people are poorly educated in history. And at the BA level, they uh, have uh, attitudes that are created among the voters, uh, and the, uh, they don't have much information on the, the big bureaucracy, which is building up this fear. And uh, I have very little confidence that the U.S. spies know very much about what's going on in foreign wars. Uh, they don't have sufficient history. They don't have sufficient economics or linguistic capabilities. And uh, the problem is that most people spend too much time looking at bad television. Now, I, as a student, went through this process. I was a student of history in 1951-52 at the age of 21, and at that time, I had the fear that the Korean War would escalate into, or might could escalate into World War III and a nuclear war. But uh, fortunately, that fear turned out to be exaggerated uh, uh, because of the uh, difficult historical ignorance I had of Korea and China and the Soviet Union. And uh, I don't have any confidence that the, the spies have uh, knew very much about Korea. And it was resolved by operations by the infantry. <laughs> And that's what ended the Korean War, not by any great secret breakthrough by any CIA agent. A rational historian or political scientist who studies contemporary history wants to know the causes of war and what makes democracy work and why fascism grew and why Stalinism grew, and what made Hitler tick, and what made Stalin tick. And theologians, and historians, and philosophers, and some journalists seek that same understanding of basic causes. And domestic crimes are interrelated with international crimes and international law. The causes of war and crime are intertwined. And uh, my question is, how do we achieve a lasting peace and domestic tranquility at home? And these two major problems are intertwined, but the majority of the voters have no idea of the complexity of this. So when Harry Truman was president from 1950 to 52, he seemed to have blundered into the Korean War. And most Americans did not understand the causes of this conflict. Stalin and Mao Zedong and Dean Acheson were the three actors who each made separate blunders and in getting into a war which none of the three really wanted. It was the North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung and the South Korean dictator Syngman Rhee who wanted to fight this war to the bitter end because they both wanted to reunite Korea on their own terms. But gradually, Stalin and Mao Zedong and Dean, well, Dean Acheson couldn't solve the problem, but Truman was not re-elected, and Eisenhower took all, and they gradually decided to uh, pressure the two Koreas to make a truce. And uh, the three of them, Eisenhower, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, 
uh, backed off for different reasons. So in July of 1953, to the surprise of everybody, uh, they had a ceasefire, but the anti-communist ideology in the United States was intensified in the media. So going back now to World War II in 1941, when Roosevelt was president, he uh, decided to back Winston Churchill in a war that was already going on in Europe. And he decided in 1930s that uh, Churchill had to be backed to defeat uh, Hitler. And Roosevelt made that decision privately in September of 1937, and he planned to save the British Empire and the British democracy. But he had a long fight with the isolationists in the United States who were still shell-shocked from World War I and did not want any war and thought that Hitler's imperialism was less of a threat than Stalin. Nevertheless, Churchill and Roosevelt were forced to have an agreement with Stalin because Hitler's army could only be defeated by the greater army of the Soviet Union. So in order to save lives, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed that they had to back uh, a three-power war against the major threat, Adolf Hitler. The American Republican leaders did not understand that strategy and assumed that the Korean War was Stalin's next move uh, was to conquer the world. And my suggestion is that Stalin uh, kind of made a blunder in backing uh, Kim Il-sung with arms and didn't realize that the United States would respond with a counterforce in order to protect South Korea. Anyway, uh, the CIA and the air power uh, expanded in the United States, and the Republicans assumed that uh, the Iron Curtain could be uh, rolled back by the Air Force and the CIA. Now, Truman had a very smart advisor for the Soviet Union, a famous diplomat by the name of George Kennan. And he had lived in Moscow a long time in the U.S. Embassy. And he knew that the United States military could not defeat a Soviet army in a land war. And he invented a strategy called containment. Stand firm in Berlin, where the line was divided between the East and the West, and build up the capitalist system in the 12 NATO nations, and stay on the defensive, and eventually the Soviet Union would collapse of its own weight and inefficiency because the communist bureaucracy could not uh, build the Soviet economy up to compete with Western capitalism. Now, Kennan's strategy took a long time, and Kennan lived a long time, and uh, gradually then, Stalin died in May of, uh, well, Stalin died rather suddenly in, in March of 53, and uh, 1953, and Khrushchev and Brezhnev continued the same Stalinist bureaucracy and uh, it was a rather static uh, bureaucracy, and gradually, Kennan's prediction came to pass. But it took until 1989, 1991 for that to uh, happen. And Gorbachev then, Michael Gorbachev, uh, the chairman of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, voluntarily dismantled the 16 Soviet nation states and uh, recognized that uh, the Soviet Union had too many domestic problems and that uh, Gorbachev couldn't keep up with this uh, technological advanced arms race at the United States and Japan and 
Western Europe had. So the United States National Security Advisors uh, and the National uh, Security Agency uh, had few elite experts, and Kennan advised Truman, don't have a big CIA bureaucracy. Only have about uh, six or 12 experts that you know personally. But that advice was not followed by the Republican administrations that followed. And uh, the National Security Advisor eventually became Henry Kissinger in 1968 to 75. And he advised President Nixon and Jerry Ford that they had to withdraw from Vietnam withdraw from an unwinnable war and a quagmire and use the Soviet Union and People's Republic of China in a balance of power system, which was the system that preserved the peace in Europe from 1815 to 1914 for 100 years. So uh, Kissinger then was conv gradually convinced Nixon that he would have to withdraw from the Vietnam Quagmire and recognize the People's Republic of China as an equal partner in the United Nations to uh, have diplomatic relations. And Nixon then made a very famous visit in 1972 at, um, in Beijing to the surprise of American public opinion. Now, the uh, American liberals in Congress could not convince Nixon and Johnson to withdraw from Indochina uh, from 1961 to 72. And we had to wait for Kissinger to do it under the table through secret diplomacy. Uh, and uh, Stalin then, uh, and the Stalinist system uh, gradually collapsed, and it collapsed because at the United, at, at, at Ohio University, these doves uh, that the uh, Democrats had built up in the Senate denouncing Johnson and Nixon, at uh, University of California at Berkeley and Michigan and uh, Ohio University began to denounce the unwillable war, and that put pressure on Nixon and Kissinger to uh, gradually withdraw. And the lead dub senator was Senator William Fulbright from Arkansas. And he uh, was well informed as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And he dealt behind the scenes under the table while the popular liberals were Eugene McCarthy, the Democrat of Minnesota, and uh, Senator Robert Kennedy of uh, New York, and Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, and Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, and Senator uh, Walter Mondale of Minnesota, who publicly came out against the war. Now, last time I made a kind of a slip on television because I was looking for the name uh, of Senator Russell Feingold, who came out of that Dove tradition. And in 2001, when George Bush escalated the Iraq war and the Afghan war, uh, Senator Russ Feingold was the one man in the Senate who voted no on the Patriot Act, which escalated this police power of the Republican administration. And in the House of Representatives, there were about 30 or 40 uh, no votes, but mostly from blacks who had no credibility. And uh, the election then uh, of, uh, of Russell Feingold and his bravery resulted in his defeat. And uh, my colleague here, um, David DeWitt, was looking for another senator from uh, Wisconsin, a liberal by the name of Paul Wellstone, 
and he died in a mysterious crash in 2002. And uh, that remains to be proven whether that was one of these unexplained accidents or just a conspiracy or what. So anyway, uh, tragically, uh, the liberals, after winning uh, in 1974 in the impeachment of Nixon, uh, didn't make any more gains. The civil rights reforms peaked in 1968 when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated and uh, the Democrats in Congress have been weak ever since in taking any new initiatives. And the Republican radical right have not taken any initiatives and uh, many Democrats have given up on the prospect of democracy and liberal reform. And the problem I see is, what is the future of the Democratic Party? Are they going to be a second Republican Party? Or are they going to be Republicans? Anyway, liberal, conservative, bipartisan, uh, passing the buck has not solved much. And I think we're ready for my first question to my guest. What do you have to say about the Snowden case and the spy who uh, could be called a whistleblower trying to restore civil rights, or he could be accused of treason? That was the show we did last month. You want to have a comment on that? Well, I, I think that Edward Snowden, I think history will prove him to be more in line with uh, Daniel Ellsberg than Good. anyone else. I agree um, with that. I think right now, obviously, uh, there's going to be a lot of charges leveled against him with regard to treason. But I think over time, his, uh, history will show and people will realize that he's much more in line with what Ellsberg did, working with news outlets to uh, selectively distribute the information that he has and, uh, and, and really just try to shine the light on uh, some really important aspects of what our government is doing and its behavior that uh, uh, free citizenry has every right to know in a democratic republic such as ours. Great. Uh, just to uh, elaborate a little bit on Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg was a patriotic United States Marine who got a job uh, in the think tanks in California uh, that did research for the Pentagon. So he had access to secret material. And McNamara, the Secretary of Defense under Kennedy in 1967, decided that the Vietnam War was unwillable and he wanted to have evidence and gave uh, Daniel Ellsberg a green light to go look at the history of the CIA of how the United States ever got involved in Indochina. So he then went to the journalists outside of the Pentagon, outside of McNamara, and went to the friendly journalist of the New York Times and said, I'm going to give this story of the history and put it in the paper. Well, Nixon tried to sue the New York Times. It went to the Supreme Court, and Ellsberg and the reporters sent other copies to the Washington Post and the Boston Herald and the Miami uh, 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 Herald and, and uh, Boston. Uh, uh, papers and and Nixon had to surrender and had to had to give up on it and could not win the case because there were too many journalists on his enemies list and that eventually helped to his impeachment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because they used that evidence in the hearings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was very. So effective. it was a victory for democracy and a defeat for the imperial president. Well, uh, I liked your summary of Snowden, and I agree with everything you've said. 
And I don't think I have anything to add here about that review. Um, except a little bit more about the personality of, of Edward Snowden. Uh, Edward Snowden was only 20 years old in 2003 when he decided to volunteer for the CIA, but he was not hired as an agent. He was hired as a contract employee, and his job was just to look at the computers for a salary and not bother to read all of the mail that he was looking at. But uh, he had some moral dilemmas at home. His parents were getting a divorce, and he apparently doesn't know much about religion or philosophy and was thinking about defecting to Buddhism. So I would like to know a little bit more about his psychology when he uh, joined the uh, computer services of CIA and DIA and started spying on all of this. So uh, the Protestants, the Catholics, and the Jews all have a moral ethical, eth uh, ethical system which are intertwined with politics and economics. And uh, the rise and fall of Hitler and Stalin cannot be uh, explained without seeing the intertwined connection between politics, history, and religious values. And both Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon assumed that the Vietnamese Civil War could be resolved by military purposes. And both were hypocrites when you look at the true values of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Now, Jimmy Carter understood this, and when it was all over, he was the only president since Herbert Hoover who served four years without being involved in any war. And he was a student of the Bible, and he, unfortunately, only had one term from 1976 to 1980, and the oil cartel defeated him and the military-industrial complex defeated him, and the people voted for Ronald Reagan, another movie actor who wanted to reignite the anti-communist crusade known as the Cold War. So I think that uh, our greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, who was a deist, Abraham Lincoln was a student of the Bible, and Franklin Roosevelt and George Washington were both liberal Episcopalians who had a very tolerant view of Jews and other Christian denominations and could see that uh, the study of history would lead to a sound strategy. And uh, unfortunately, uh, most people went for the simple solutions uh, and so I would like to know a little bit more about, uh, and hope we can find out, uh, about Snowden's uh, struggle with his own conscience. Because he worked for the CIA on his contract from 2003-2013 when he decided that he would defect, and he defected through a friendly journalist in, uh, in Britain and release these secret documents uh, rather selectively. Would you like to say anything more about this? Um, well, I, I can't really speak to his motivations as far as it related to his spirituality or his exploration of Buddhism. Um, Nobody I, can. Yeah. It's a secret so far. Okay. But but uh, uh, I only picked this up through clues of, of trying to find out who is this guy Snowden. And he seems to be a youth who got into computers because he thought he was a patriot. But when he was reading all of this stuff and the collection of all of this stuff, he began to see that there were some Vietnamese. We're halfway through. We have to stop here.
Uh, my guest is uh, Dave DeWitt, and we're talking about uh, the growing police state and how Snowden has tried to blow the whistle. And we're trying to uh, continue on, and we were finishing up with any other comments about Snowden we would like to make at this point. Do you have any further? Well, I think that uh, it's interesting what you mentioned about Snowden's patriotism because if he got into the CIA uh, to begin with out of a sense of uh, patriotism and national obligation, I think that he ended up uh, leaking the documents that he did and exposing the programs that he did also out of a sense of patriotism and duty to his well, country. Well, he saw too many but casualties it, in Vietnam. Yeah. Are you Unexplained. Snowden? Snowden did. Okay. He saw that in the internet because that's how, how uh, Julian Assange and, and uh, get into the story. They, mm -hmm. they gave him clues. Manning gave him clues. Right. And Manning was jailed because he was on the ground in Vietnam. And this, this stuff secretly uh, led him to look at all of the collection of is there millions, millions of telephone records. What are they going to do with that? No rational person can think that uh, this would lead to any uh, conclusion on the part of the 17 intelligence agencies. So from 1790 to 2000, uh, the FBI and the sheriffs had to have warrants and tried to understand the Fourth Amendment you had to accuse a criminal with, uh, with probable cause. Now, uh, who knows what, what they know. Well, anyway, the Senate seems to be trying to cut this back, and maybe we'll get some legislation. Maybe we'll have to have a 2016 election, and hopefully uh, Snowden will come back to the United States free. But that remains to be seen. I just often see the unfortunate uh, point of view that people who are critical of the United States government or who dare to question American policies are somehow unpatriotic for doing so. I actually take the exact opposite point right. of view. I think that people who, who question their government and try to hold the American, our republic to the standards that right. we set forth in our own constitution and bill of rights are very patriotic, and right. Uh, right. I, I think that's a false accusation. Right, absolutely Too true. Too often repeated. Absolutely true. Okay, we'll go on to a new question now. I think uh, 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 we can raise the question of what is your opinion of the evolution of democracy. How far back do we want to go to give a summary of uh, how democracy was expanding? Do we want to go back to the end of World War II, 1945? Do we want to go back to the founding of the Constitution in 1790? How does democracy operate and how do we restore democratic values on the part of the ordinary citizen to avoid this supposedly growing police state. I see democracy as the long struggle of our republic from the very beginning because you had uh, right. uh, you had people who were essentially monarchists at the beginning of the republic um, or at least supported some sort of monarchical ideal, you know, democracy only uh, went to landowners, Caucasian landowners, you know. Um, and I think that it, throughout American history, we've struggled toward democracy, trying to expand the franchise and expand right. opportunity. Right. And, and there's always a tension and a force who's fighting against that expansion of the franchise and expansion of opportunity right. and true democracy in our republic. So that's a battle that, that's been raging forever, and we continue to fight it. Um, what, one of the biggest concerns that I have that we've seen recently, especially with regard to the Supreme Court, is this idea that somehow corporations are equal to people 
right. with regard to democratic opportunity. Individuals, and in fact, in such as the Hobby Lobby case, corporations or companies have more right, right. than the individual. Right. And that, I think, is very dangerous to democracy because democracy is all about expanding the power of the people to self-govern right. and control this republic. Right. And uh, when you put... In the, when you pit individual rights against corporate rights and declare that corporations are people, I think you're getting into very dangerous territory. We've seen it with Citizens United, McCutcheon, now Hobby Lobby. Right. All of these decisions by the Supreme Court are right. lending themselves to this idea that the company is a person too. And you typically at the expense of the individuals who work for the company and their rights. And... Uh, that's a dangerous precedent that's been set up by a court that's always been politicized, but especially in the past three or four decades, it's this long-running political game of controlling the court. Yeah. And yeah. you have these five, four decisions right. uh, where the, the bench is deeply partisan. Right. And, uh, and I just think that's dangerous as far as uh, following the rule of law and our Constitution. Well, I, uh, as the historian, would like to say, I would like to go back to the Constitution and uh, point out that the Constitution has three branches of government. The Congress makes the laws, 535 members in Congress, 435 members in the House of Representatives, and 100 senators since 1960. And back when the 13 states formed the Federal Union in 1789, there were 26 senators from the 13 states. So the people elect one president, one vice president, and the president is supposed to enforce the laws of Congress. And the president appoints 15 people in the cabinet. And the three most important cabinet offices are the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, who runs the Department of Justice, and the TV talks about the White House. Now, that's a myth. That hides the fact that the presidency inherits two million bureaucrats who are faceless. Now, the third branch of government, nine justices on the Supreme Court, have a job of deciding disputes between two state governments, disputes that arise between the federal government and foreign governments in international law. And the Ed Snowden case, is an international legal case because he's now using Russia as a place of asylum. And uh, so this is a case of, of international law and it's going to be the Supreme Court which can evaluate these various charges and counter charges. So what I'm saying is democracy evolved with the three branches of government and the 48 states when I was a kid and 50 states now, all in a balance of power situation. So I thought I would review that a little bit of how this decline of democracy is partly the responsibility of the Supreme Court, partly the Congress, and partly bad presidents and the media. Who, who are not uh, very historically inclined. So, would you like to expand on the history of the Department of Justice and the Attorney General and how the weak federal government was able to start this police state? The FBI was only started in 1924. In the early history of the Republic, right. it was governors and uh, state's attorney generals and local sheriffs in the 88 counties of Ohio that enforces the law and 
look at the Bill of Rights. And Ohio Constitution has its own Bill of Rights. And could there be a more perfect illustration of the danger that the police state can, uh, can uh, impose on the American people than the leader of the FBI for oh so many years, J. Edgar Hoover, Good. who uh, eventually, under Johnson, ended up getting a lifetime appointment to the position, and he was virtually, I mean, this was a guy who went around blackmailing That's senators right. and congressmen right. into doing his bidding and uh, making sure that they didn't do anything that was against his power structure. And one of the biggest uh, examples of, of just malfeasance and, and corruption in office was the COINTEL program that went after uh, some of uh, America's most influential people. What year was this now? Th this was in the 60s. This okay. was the program that he used to go to secretly tape record people from Martin Luther King That's Jr. Right. To, That's right. to uh, the he SDS. He was born in Washington, uh, D.C. He was an old Southerner, and he thought that uh, subversion came from the blacks. Right. <laughs> and and he, all of this anti-communism was somewhat of a, of a phony because he never studied the Soviet Union or didn't know anything about Karl Marx or Lenin or anything. Yeah, it was a red herring. <laughs> it, was a, it was an excuse for him to, to gather as much power as he could. That's right. And exert as much influence over everybody he could in the city of Washington, D.C. and beyond. And, well, and this is the illustration is that he ran this huge bureaucracy and this bureaucracy is is totally is not immune at all to the foibles of human character. That's right. And J. Edgar Hoover is a perfect example with COINTELPRO. And he, and, and he ignored the Fourth Amendment. In the oh, First Amendment. totally <laughs> flouted it openly, and uh, and, and why it was didn't really dangerous. And why did call him to, to to task? After he got his lifetime appointment. Well, no, this goes back to Roosevelt. Why oh yeah. Couldn't Roosevelt fire him? I, well, maybe he had some juicy stuff on Roosevelt. Well, I'll, I'll give you the story. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was somewhat of a good guy from 1924 to 38. Now, in 1938, Roosevelt is concerned about Nazism. And they set up this committee known as the House Un-American Activities Committee to investigate fascists, Italian fascist, German Nazis, and Japanese <laughs> Americans who were all suspect of possibly having spies. But most of the Republicans, including J. Edgar, who were more worried about communism than fascism. Well, <laughs> because he thought that the liberals were kind of uh, suckered in to civil rights and uh, democratic values and so forth and so on. And he sent a spy out to spy on Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh. And Eleanor Roosevelt had to be the eyes and ears of a president who had infantile paralysis. So she was a very active campaigner. And she was closely related to Teddy Roosevelt. She was a direct descendant of Teddy Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt was only a remote mm -hmm. uh, descendant of, of Franklin. So she had a lot of prestige in her own right. And she went around when Roosevelt was governor in the 1920s in, in New York and went around campaigning for him. And she became interested in foreign policy, and in 1938, she was anti-fascist, and she was more anti-fascist than Roosevelt was, Franklin Roosevelt was. Well, anyway, she was involved with a left-wing character by the name of Joseph Lash, and they were in a hotel room, and <laughs> just with Martin Luther King, J. Edgar Hoover sends a a report on Eleanor's liaison with Joseph Lash. Rose was so angry, he tore this up and threw it away and said, I don't want to hear any reports about, about Eleanor. But Roosevelt dare not fight her. Right. 
Hoover. Hoover, because Mr. Edgar Hoover had an enemies list on every guy in Congress. Right. Anybody who was involved in adultery, he had or all homosexuality, the dirt. or alcohol, he had a little little blackmail list. Right. So he always got appropriations, any appropriations, a full. So this lifetime appointment. He blackmailed was, his way was, into was, was as a, much power was a as done he wanted. Deal. Yeah. And when Truman got in there, problem was that Truman had been collaborating with Stalin during the Second World War. Truman didn't know anything about it, but he inherited the coalition and was still allied to Stalin when, when the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. Yeah. And they had to agree on, on at Potsdam uh, how they would take care of Japan and take care of Poland. He had lots of problems with the Soviet Union and the nuclear bombs. So, yeah. so Truman was being investigated for coddling spies. So Truman had a, and then they had the Alger Hiss case, and right. the Rosenberg case. So Truman was on the defensive. Truman couldn't say anything about FBI and when the Republicans charged uh, subversion, well, the FBI is taking care of it. The FBI is. He would rather have Hoover do it than the House on American Activities. That well, was right, the yeah, that because was the problem. yeah, McCarthy <laughs> was the uh, apex of that hysteria. But and but behind the scenes, McCarthy and Hoover were working together. Right. Sure. Hoover gave of reports to McCarthy. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> because but, it's all about power. All about power. Right. That's the, the tragic life of, of the Democrats on the defensive. Well, I think we, we've gone into the FBI uh, question pretty, pretty well. So that uh, FBI power grows, and then in 45, we have James V. Forrestal. How does he get involved in this? Who is he? Do you know anything about James Forrestal? I don't know much about Forrestal. I've heard of him. Okay. Well, Forrestal was the Assistant Secretary of Navy. Mm -hmm. And when Roosevelt died, Truman appointed Forrestal as the Secretary of Navy because he was a Princeton uh, stock salesman and knew anything, he knew all about the arms business in the Navy Department in World War II. Mm -hmm. And Roosevelt's Secretary of Navy was Frank Knox, a journalist. Well, he died and retired, and Forrestal inherits the position. Well, Forrestal and the Army and the Navy decide to reorganize the War Department, and the War Department becomes the Army Department, and the Air Force becomes a separate unit the Marines become a separate union, unit, and Roosevelt had this temporary spy organization called the OSS. The OSS was dismantled when Truman first came in there because he thought we were going to return to normalcy. So there was no spy agency from 1946 to 47. 47, the Pentagon is organized, hmm. and James V. Forrestal is the new Secretary of Defense, and the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the CIA are all his undersecretaries. Well, he was, like Hoover, paranoid about communism. And he actually had to go to the hospital for psychiatric treatments because That's he right. thought they Communists were everywhere. That's how I know that guy's name. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that story now. Yeah. And he committed suicide. He jumped out the window. Yes, yes, exactly. The conspiracy theorists right. love that Well, one. anyway, Forrestal collaborates with this Cold War propaganda. And they get William Donovan, who used to be the OSS chairman under Roosevelt, who was a temporary intelligence officer who used computers and signal corps in World War I, and the OSS was a cryptologist organization. And they got most of their intelligence from MI6 and MI5 from the mm -hmm. British. The British guided OSS. <coughs> the
the OSS had no major breakthroughs. But anyway, they had the money. So the CIA starts this whole big bureaucracy, which I kind of hinted at with Kennan. And Kennan said, well, Truman, use very few of these CIA agents and don't have a vast bureaucracy. So this begins with Forrestal, and Truman didn't do too much CIA work in the Korean War. But when Eisenhower is elected, he expands the CIA agents because John Forster Dulles is much more of the hardline anti-communist and wouldn't hire Kennan in the Republican administration mm. and put Kennan on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to roll back the Iron Curtain. So that's the Cold War philosophy, yeah. you'll see. Well, I think this history all, I mean, there's nothing new in history, you know, and uh, I think that the history that we're discussing here is uh, great, should act as a warning toward uh, the situation that we find ourselves in today. Correct. Um, because we've seen the abuse that can happen. We've seen the witch hunts that can happen. We can see the egomaniacal power seeking that can happen and the dangers that it uh, that it uh, has to uh, a true free democracy and a true democratic republic. And I think that that's, that's what we've got to be wary of when we look at what Snowden's revealed, when we look at what Manning's right. revealed, and, uh, and we look at what our government's actually doing. And that's why transparency is important. That's why we've got to be on our toes, well-informed right. and, uh, and wary of what's happening. Now I'm going to ask a, a kind of a surprising question to you. Uh, I suggest that the American people maintain the peace and have the attitude of a peace-loving people between 1790 when George Washington was inaugurated up to Pearl Harbor Day on the 7th of December 19. 41. Do you agree with that proposition or do you find that a little fantastic? <laughs> um, I find that a little fantastic. You do? Um, that the American people were peace-loving between 1790 and 1941? Well, what's the counter-evidence? Um, well... Where did this warlike mentality come from? I mean, I guess the most obvious one would be come the... From? Well, I, all right, so you mean the police state then? Well, the police state is a product of, of the, the war. The Cold War, and or the Cold war, war turned war. into the war any on war. terrorism. Okay. Right, but, but going back to our early wars. Well, we had territorial problems yeah, and expansion. We, but, but we don't what, have that anymore. All right, but how did the, how did the, why was the United States a peace-loving country from 1790 to December 1941? How many wars were the United States involved in? Well, there's the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War. Two years for the War of The Civil War. Two years for the The war Mexican against war. the Philippines. All right, well, let's talk about the Civil War. The Great the, War. The, the Civil War is four years. Yeah. The Philippines, <laughs> three so, months. So, yeah, if you months. add up all the years. <laughs> but there was also lots of civil strife, all the, uh, okay, the uprisings the with the yeah, people okay, versus the, the American if, government. If you want to talk about the American Indians, that's another topic. And Some, labor strife, though. Well, let's talk about the American Indians. We could have another topic on American imperialism. Yeah. Okay. But I'm just talking about the average voter who voted for a Democrat or Republican from George Washington's day up to Franklin Roosevelt was primarily interested in preserving the peace. And the wars that we had came as a surprise. The War of 1812... Well, yeah, presidents that, always won as peace candidates. Okay. The, the War of 1812 was a mismanaged war of Mr. Madison. Yeah. There was a huge dissent on the part of the New England states in New York. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That war was brought about by land-hungry people from... Ohio, Connecticut, and Kentucky, who thought that the militia 
could go up to Canada and conquer Canada. Yeah. This was a pipe dream. <laughs> Poor Mr. Madison's great mistake in an otherwise and stellar it was John, career. John Quincy Adams who bailed it out and, and there was something like 13 senators who voted no and 19 senators voted yes. The yes senators were all from the southern states. They had this great faith. Yeah. And Madison found out that the militia flopped. Right. And well, these militia couldn't get any loans from the banks. The White House got burned to the ground. <laughs> anyway, that was a two-war thing, and people gave John Quincy Adams the blessing for returning peace, and Mr. Monroe became the... Yeah, and then the era of good feelings. Great feelings. That's yeah. right. So the United States became a peace-loving nation until Mr. Well, Polk. Yeah, well, now, he, well, that Polk was territorial. Did, all right, what did well, Polk, how did Polk get into that? He sent some people across the border into Mexico, and then they came back on our side, and then the Mexicans came onto our side, and he said, wait a minute, you can't do that, and he declared war on Mexico and got a lot of land from them. Well, it was a little more difficult than that. Yeah, well, obviously, that's a 15-second summary. The American, the American summary. states were expanding from east to west. And the people from Massachusetts went to Ohio. The people from Georgia went into Alabama and Mississippi. And Thomas Jefferson bought the port of New Orleans. And they got all of that land out of the Rocky Mountains. So the country was expanding from east to west, slave states and free states, through the Missouri Compromise. And they kept the peace. Now, Polk was a sudden blip. Because what happened in Texas was that whites from Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi bought land on a private enterprise basis and bought land in an unsettled part of Mexico. And the Mexican governors in, in, in Mexico City didn't know anything about it and didn't care. Well, Texas whites, Anglos, decided in 1845 to declare the Lone Star State free and independent. Now, Polk was elected in 1844, and his campaign slogan was the Oregon Territory. His campaign slogan was 5440 to fight. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And he was going to expand in Oregon. He didn't pay any attention to Texas, at least publicly. Yes. But Tennessee was a slave state, and Polk knew that if he got Texas in the Union, this would give the southern states more land to settle, and they could keep that balance in the Senate, mm -hmm. because the northern states were winning. Nebraska, Iowa, New Mexico, I mean Minnesota, the free labor was mm -hmm. going ahead. So, so Polk pulled off a fast one. So the American army under Zachary Taylor went down to Mexico City and defeated Mexico in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. It was the easiest victory, and all he had to do was recognize the boundary. Oh, we only got two minutes. We'll have to stop. Well, anyway, uh, we're going to have to continue this at some other time. What I wanted to make clear was that there were 151 years of peace between 1790 and December 1941, and there were uh, only 10 years of war, if you had to add up all of those wars. Mm -hmm. So America was mostly American people, American voters were mostly peace-loving. So Leave why are we in perpetual war now? I, I think the I thing, think it has to do with the consolidation of power. Well, it yeah, it begins with World War II, expanded into Vietnam, and we now right. have the warfare state. Yeah, the Cold War, the war on terrorism, these well, wars that never what, end. Right. Well, I think we're going to have to do a little more on the Supreme Court because yes. this is background of how democracy was working right. up to the Second World War. And democracy is on the defensive since it's like, that's my major point. What is your major point in this conclusion? Uh, my major point is that uh, only the power of the people can change things, and that's the essence of democracy. 
I'm glad you came. And Thank I you believe so much. in democracy is the necessary to keep the debate going. And I welcome your return. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> glad to. Anytime. <laughs>